Hi, a very good morning, all of you. So let's proceed with some additional topics based on keywords which we received in this 10th part of paper discussion video series. I hope you guys are all ready. So first we'll deal with the following topic, width of attached in JavaOps and how it varies depending upon various physiological or pathologic conditions. As you can see, this is an illustration representing the relation between gingival margin with that of crown and root surface. You can see occlusal plane, original gingival margin location, original CJ location, mucogingival junction. And most importantly, as you know, width of attached in Java, which is represented by the distance from mucogingival junction gingival margin which approximates to width of attached gingiva. So let's review some information related to this. So as I said this is a illustration representing relation between gingival margin with that of crown and root surface. We have illustrations A, B, C and D to the extreme left. A represents normal relationship with gingival margin 1 to 2 mm above CEJ. B represents wear of incisal edge and continued tooth eruption. Gingival margin remains in same position as that of A. And what about width of attached gingiva? So it remains unchanged. Whereas C, wear of incisal edge with continued tooth erection, the gingival margin has moved with the tooth, therefore, the entire dentogingival complex has moved coronally with resulting increase in width of attached gingiva. Right? In case of illustration D, extreme left, no wear of incisal edge is evident. However, gingiva has moved apically and clinical recession is evident. And because of this, the width of attached gingiva is reduced. Okay. So various contexts where there is either uh, increase in width of attached gingiva or decrease or it can remain unchanged depending upon the parameters given over there. Right. I hope this information is helpful in answering your query. If not, let me know. And we'll definitely provide you more inputs and description part of the video, right? Now let's move on to the next topic. Gingivectomy indications, those are the keywords chat received. So you can see various indications and contraindications of gingivectomy. Again, if you need any additional information or further clarification, if at all there are any additional keywords associated with this topic, do let us know. Now, moving on to the next topic, doxycycline, a very taxing bacteria, those are the keywords which are received, as you can see. This illustration represents bacterial protein synthesis and various sites at which antibiotics act, represented by one, two, three, and four accordingly. So tetracyclines, observe the number two, serial number two, that's where tetracyclines act. Tetracyclines bind to 30s ribosome and inhibit aminoacyl tRNA attachment to the A site. As a consequence, blocks protein synthesis. So it is primarily bacteriostatic. So tetracyclines are primarily bacteriostatic, inhibit protein synthesis by binding to 30s ribosomes in susceptible organisms. Subsequent to such binding, attachment of mRNA to mRNA ribosome complexes interfered with, as you can see. As a result, peptide chain fails to grow. The sense to organisms have an energy-dependent active transport process which concentrates tetracyclines intracellularly. In case of gram-negative tetracyclines diffuse through porine channels as well. The more lipid-soluble members, which include doxycycline and minocycline, enter by passive diffusion. And this is attributed to their, partly attributed to their high potency. And the carrier involved in active transport of retrocyclines is absent in host cells, so we are spared. Moreover, protein synthesizing apparatus of host cells is less sensitive to tetracyclines. These two factors are responsible for selective toxicity of tetracyclines for microbes. So let me know if you need any additional information. Moving on, so these are the keywords which are received, metazapine and noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressants, right? So let's review some information. So antidepressant drugs, as the name itself indicates, these are the drugs which elevate mood in depressive illness. So we have a classification as you can see. So tricyclic antidepressants, so these especially, right, inhibit monamine uptake and interact with variety of receptors via muscarinic, alpha adrenergic, histamine, H1, 5-HT1, 5-HT2, and occasionally dopamine, D2. Whereas coming to the newer selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, and atypical antidepressants based on which you had equation, these newer drugs interact with fewer receptors and have more limited spectrum of action. 
producing fewer side effects. And coming to metazepine in specific, it's a recently released antidepressant which acts by novel mechanism via alpha-2 auto and heteroreceptors enhancing both NA and 5 steroids. Hence, it is named as noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressant. NASSA, NASA, or whatever you call it, right? So I hope this information is helpful in answering your query. Now, let's move on to the next topic. Recurrent herpes labialis. So these are the keywords which I received. So let's review some information. So recurrent herpes simplex. In fact, we discussed this previously as well in our classes in one of the live sessions. After initial infection, whether symptomatic or not, there may be no further clinical manifestations throughout life. However, where viral immunity is insufficient, recurrent infections are common, especially type 2 genital herpes. Recurrent herpes simplex infection may occur at a wide varying, uh, variety and varying intervals from nearly every month in some patients to only about once a year or even less in others. In fact, I've seen uh, some of my friends having these recurrent infections at a particular time every year. The lesions may develop either at a site of primary inoculation or an adjacent area supplied by the involved ganglion. It may develop on lips, which is called as recurrent herpes labialis, as you can see in the left illustration, or intraorally. In either location, the lesions are frequently preceded by burning or tingling sensation and a feeling of tautness, swelling, or slight soreness, the location in which the vesicles subsequently develop. These vesicles are generally small, 1 mm or less in diameter, tend to occur in localized clusters and may coalesce to form somewhat larger lesions. These gray or white vesicles rupture quickly, leaving a small red ulceration, sometimes with a slight erythematous halo. On the lips, these ruptured vesicles become covered by a brownish crust and the degree of pain present is quite variable. It has been emphasized by Weathers and Griffin that recurrent intraoral herpetic lesions almost invariably develop on oral mucosa that is tightly bound to periosteum. Consider this very, very important. Rarely do they occur on mobile mucosa in contrast to recurrent diaphthous stomatitis, which almost invariably occurs on mobile mucosa. A very important distinguishing feature. Thus, the most common sites for recurrent intraoral herpetic lesions are heart palate, attached gingiva, or alveolar ridge. Interestingly, herpes labialis is rarely or seldom seen concurrently with intraoral lesions. The lesions gradually heal within 7 to 10 days and leave no scar. Right? I hope this information is suffice. Uh, let me know if you need any further clarification. Moving on, goat milk, anemia, these are the keywords which I received. So, based on this, you can find some relevant literature from one of the PubMed index articles. Goat's milk is known to be deficient in vitamin D, B12, iron, especially folate. Let me know uh, if you need any further clarification in regard to this query. Okay. Now, moving on, uremic pericarditis. So, what's the line of treatment? So, those are the keywords which I received. First of all, uremic pericarditis is a major complication of kidney disease and may occur in patients with acute or chronic failure. Before or even during dialysis treatment. You can see left side, it's a CT scan of chest showing pericardial effusion with bilateral pleural effusion in a patient with uremic pericarditis. And coming to treatment, as mentioned, one of the articles, treatment of uremic pericarditis includes initiation of dialysis if the patient is not on dialysis and intensification of dialysis treatment in a patient who is already on dialysis and avoidance of systemic anticoagulation because of increased risk of bleeding and pericardial damage in the event of pre-tamponate or tamponate, right? So these are uh, some of the uh, keywords which I received based on which I've compiled this particular slide. Let me know if you need any further clarification or information, right? Moving on, endotracheal tube, parts of endotracheal tube, so I've been getting several keywords related to this. So as you can see, this particular image illustrates endotracheal tube. Endotracheal tube was first reliably used way back in the early 1900s. In its simplest form, it's a tube constructed of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, that is placed between the vocal cords through the trachea to produce a pathway to provide oxygen and inhaled gases to the lungs. It also serves to protect lungs from contamination such as gastric contents and blood. It has the following components. As you can see, we have a tube and then a cuff, bevel, Murphy's eye connector. So there are various components. So cuff is one of the keywords that is here. So as you can see, 
an inflated cuff on the left part of the slide. So cuff is an inflatable balloon at the distal end of endotracheal tube. Pediatric endotracheal tubes are produced with and without cuffs. The inflated cuff produces a seal against tracheal wall, which prevents gastric contents from entering the trachea and facilitates execution of positive pressure ventilation. Let me know uh, if you need any further clarification regarding the identification of any part related to this endotracheal tube. Okay, now moving on to the next topic. Uh, so OHIS and then DMFT, so two indices, you have a clinically oriented question, uh, depending upon the number of teeth decay, depending upon the amount of baby that's present. So I have no idea this, about the specifics of the question, so you must be knowing it much better. But let me put you some basic concepts so that with understanding of these concepts, you can, uh, you can answer any question from these questions, uh, applicative type of questions without any doubt. So OHIS, in fact, we discussed the same even in one of the quick revision classes, if you remember, uh, before the exam. So as you can see, uh, left side, so six teeth and surfaces are scored in simplified index and right side top, you can see debris index, scoring method for debris and then bottom, you can see scoring method for calculus. So the criteria are as follows, as you can see, so debris index or scoring criteria for debris starting from zero, one, two and three. So obviously the intensity or the amount of debris that's covering increases with each score. So zero score is assigned when there is no debris or stain present. One score one is assigned when soft debris covering not more than one third of tooth surface being examined or presence of extensive stains without debris regardless of surface area cover. So these are the criteria. And score two is assigned when soft debris covering more than one third, but not more than two thirds of exposed tooth surface. And score three is assigned when soft debris covering more than two thirds of exposed tooth surface, as you can see in these illustrations. And then coming to scoring criteria calculus, again, more or less the same. So zero is assigned when there is no calculus present. One is assigned when superangial calculus covering not more than one third of exposed tooth surface being examined. Two, uh, superangial calculus covering more than one third but not more than two thirds of exposed tooth surface and or presence of individual flex or subgingival calculus around the cervical portion of tooth. And then score three is assigned when superangial calculus covering more than two thirds of exposed tooth surface or a continuous heavy band of subgingival calculus around the cervical portion of tooth. So we're all assigning this for our convenience so that we can uh, formulate treatment plan. So we're categorizing based on these indices, based on the indices scores, and then uh, based on which we can formulate treatment plans accordingly. So individual scores, debris index or calculus index, if the score is between zero to 0.6, as we discussed prior, if you remember, it's good oral hygiene, 0 0.7 to 1.8 fail, 1.9 to 3 poor oral hygiene. And when you combine this debris score and calculus score, 0 to 1.2 good oral hygiene, 1.3 to 6 fail, and then 3.1 to 6 poor oral hygiene. You can refer previous duration class for the same. Okay. I hope this information is suffice in answering it well. If you need more inputs, uh, if you remember the question as such, entire question as such, drop it in the form of comments uh, and we'll provide you more clarification if needed. Now, moving on to the final topic, DMFT. So there are various criteria that have to be considered. Again, if you need more information, let me know. We'll update accordingly in the description part of the video. So DMFT index was developed by Clean, Palmer and Natsan way back in 1938. So D stands for decayed, M for missing and F for filled. So selection of teeth, you have the following criteria. All 28 teeth are examined. However, the following are not included. Observe them carefully. And then uh, rules for scoring DMFT, no tooth should be counted more than once. Decayed missing filled teeth should be recorded separately. Tooth lost or filled due to reasons other than caries are not included. Deciduous teeth are not considered in DMFT index. A tooth with several fillings is counted as one tooth okay and then you have various criteria for recording consider this a very very important right and criteria for identification of dental caries let me conclude with this lesion is clinically visible and obvious go for it and then discoloration or loss of translucency typical of undermined or demineralized enamel and if there is definite catch and explorative can penetrate into soft yielding material dental caries it is so criteria for identifying or identification of dental caries so I hope this information is uh, 
sufficient for answering the query. Anyways, if you need, as I said, any further clarification, yes, get back to mail or drop a comment below. We'll try to address it within 24 to 48 hours. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. So if you have more keywords, you can get back to mail or drop a comment. We'll incorporate these keywords in our upcoming discussions as soon as possible. So appreciate your love, understanding, and keep smiling. Most importantly, enjoy your time. Take care. Have a fantastic day ahead. Love you all.